Welcome to the Citadel Gray Line. My name is Kyle Weaver. I'm an ex-Citadel football player. I'm here with Jeff Hartzell from the Post and Courier. And we are excited to be talking um, some Citadel football after the dogs win. Um, Jeff, they went down to Chattanooga like we just talked about on Facebook Live, which everybody should join us on. And uh, they came out with a big win and played well, gave up some brushing yards, but also, you know, ran the ball very well. But they came up big when it really mattered. And mm -hmm. in the fourth quarter, they, they pulled it out. In the second half, they played well. They did a 2014 victory on the road at Chattanooga. Uh, defense really rose up in the second half, made some adjustments to Chattanooga actually ran the ball pretty good in the right. first half, and they have not been running the ball all year. But they made the adjustments in the second half, and uh, Aaron Spann came up with the big end zone interception, and the Bulldogs ran for 400 yards. So it was good to see some smiles and some rushing yards. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, guys like Aaron Spann, two interceptions, that's huge. Uh, you know, it's, last time we went down to Chattanooga and beat Chattanooga, I mean, I, I don't, I can't remember. I don't think we did it during my time period. So, uh, you know, it's pretty crazy that even down in a down year right now, uh, we went down in Chattanooga, who's been a power uh, power team in our conference for a while and beat them. So that was a good win. We definitely needed that. It kept our playoff hopes alive. Um, and then we go to VMI this week. Homecoming. Do they, yeah, they come to us, but we have VMI this week, mm -hmm. and that's another game that we can rebuild our confidence, get our steam going before we head into some tough schedules and uh, tough teams ending the season. Yeah, the VMI has really struggled this year, 0-8 so far, not really competitive in conference games, although they played Western Carolina pretty good last week. They lost 26-7, to but it was a tight game for a long okay. time. So a little bit better, and of course you know, VMI can make their season with a win on Saturday. They'll yeah. sell, if they win, they'll celebrate like it's the Super Bowl. Right, and I was talking to some players last night, and basically they were saying that you know they're prepared for trick plays. They're prepared for them to throw everything and anything at them uh, because – these guys have nothing else to lose, and this is the game that they have circled on their schedule. You know, we're SoCon champs, we're the other military school, all these things mm -hmm. that these guys, and we're their homecoming. Like, we, we moved up our homecoming uh, just so we could play these guys for homecoming. So, you know, I know as a player, when, when teams did that to us, you know, we viewed that as a sign of disrespect. And Yeah, and, you know, last year that's what they did, a couple of trick plays, fake punt, and the game was only 30-20. to 20. Right. So they played the Citadel tough last year and that was a great citadel team yep so they're going to throw everything they have at uh, the citadel on saturday if things go according to the stats and what's on paper should be a fun, fun citadel game. should win and it, it's always a fun game when they play vmi awesome well we're going to be right back we're going to uh, take a little quick break and we'll start talking some citadel football Welcome back to the Cyril Gray Line. We are in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina at the Charleston Sports Pub right off 17 in the town center. Um, this is a great place to come, and we're very grateful that they're having us out today. Um, we also want to talk about some Cyril football. Uh, we, like we talked about in our opening segment, you know, we beat Chattanooga, who preseason Chattanooga, I think, was ranked fourth in the conference. Mm -hmm. And we were ranked uh, third or second? Second. So, I mean, this was going to be a game that was going to be huge. Um, both of these teams have been in the SOCON contention for the title uh, for the last three, four years. And I know exactly. that we, we tied it my, my red shirt junior right. year. So, you know, these teams definitely have a history of success in the SOCON um, ever since App and uh, Georgia Southern left. Mm -hmm. But um, overall, you know, like we talked about, we're going to go deeper into it. The D came up big at, when it mattered at the end with the Aaron Span interception. Uh, we got our rushing game back a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the young offensive line seemed to have some success mm -hmm. against these guys. We almost had a 100-yard rusher. And then um, there was big numbers on both sides. And we also want to talk about some special teams numbers that kind of I noticed on, on your article that kind of mm -hmm. slept up that maybe will come com some concerns moving forward. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kickoff return was not good against uh, Chattanooga. They gave up a couple of 50-yard returns. 
And, you know, when you score, especially in a tight game or when points have been hard to come by, the last thing you want to do is give the other team a head start on right. coming back. So they gave up a couple of 50-yard touchdown returns and then a long punt return. On a, It was a low driving punt with not much hang time. And the kid from Chattanooga is the same kid who did all the returns. Brandon Dowdell is his name. Right. And I believe he's just a freshman. He caught the punt on the run and just boom, right up the yeah. sideline. So, uh, yeah, special teams needs to be cleaned up. Jake Godick, uh, I thought, did a good job. You know, he mi- the field goal kicker. He missed his first two. One was from 51, so that's a tough ask. The other was from 27, and he kind of shanked it. But he came back from that and kicked two field goals in the second half that ended up being you know, a 2014 difference. game, ended up being the difference. So I thought he did a good job of coming back from a tough start. And uh, the Citadel needs – they haven't even been kicking field goals when they get in the red zone. Right. So at least this time they cut some field goals. You know, it, and – People say, well, why is it so tough to win at the Citadel? This is a perfect example of something. So we have a freshman kicker mm-hmm. who comes in and is our starter punter, and then he leaves the team for a Army contract, I believe. So you can't blame the kid. You know, he, he kind of found his focus and what he wants to do. But as a football perspective, re- we recruited a kid. We had the kid we wanted. He was doing a good job in the first game. He leaves the team. And then comes back, and we have to start a um, different punter who uh, has has been doing a good job, but has had some ups and downs. And, and this might play a role into why um, we had some big big returns. Maybe there wasn't enough airtime and all this other stuff. So you know, just one of those little things that adds up at the Citadel. You know, you give up a few big returns, and that adds up in a in a very mm-hmm. competitive game. Well, the defense was able to uh, to withstand those and shut them out in the second half. So really great effort by Blake Errol and his guys. In the first half, I think they were trying to give the back end a little bit of help right. on coverage with the linebackers and see if Chattanooga could run the ball. Well, they could. Right. <laughs> Daryl Bridges ran for 120-something yards and two touchdowns in the first half, and he'd only run for 195 all season. So uh, Blake Errol made that adjustment at halftime, shut down the run game, and made a freshman quarterback have to beat them. He couldn't do it. Right. You know, that's, that's, that's football. That's awesome that, that, you know, the coach Harrell and they went in there and, you know, made some adjustments and, um, you know, it, it came out big as well. So, and the offense, I mean, like we talked about earlier, they started make, they seemed to make some adjustments from week to week, some improvements. They ran the ball very well. How many rushing yards did they have today? 405 was- against Chattanooga. And, uh, most of it was the slot backs. Grant Drakeford was the leading rusher, 97 yards. And then Cam Jackson had a big day. Dominique Allen had a long, finally a long run for Dominique Allen, a 54-yarder. Still having trouble getting the fullbacks going, the B-backs. Um, although Brandon Rainey and Lorenzo Ward did ground out a few first downs when they had to. Like third and two, they got two. Right. You know, got enough for a first down, which right. is which is what you need. But they they haven't had a Tyler Renew type day, and it, maybe it's unfair to expect them to uh, to uh, be right. able to Tyler Renew at this stage in their careers. It is unfair. Uh, I think we might see a little bit more of Brandon Berry this week uh, at fullback against VMI. Um, he's the big freshman who came in against the East Tennessee State. But we haven't really seen much of him uh, since he fumbled against Mercer. And that, that's kind of what Tyler Renew went through. He right. had some fumble problems early in his career, set for a while, and uh, fixed those and came back to have one of the great careers yeah. uh, in Citadel history. So uh, maybe Brandon Berry has fixed his problem. And he's, he's 230 pounds. Right. So he can bring the bring the thunder at fullback. And I think we'll see him against VMI. So a name that I was excited that you said was Cam Jackson, you know, just to hear that he was getting involved. I mean, yeah. that's a guy that preseason we thought would be a lot more involved. And mm-hmm. teams are taking him away. Um, and that's how it is. But, you know, it's good to hear that he had a few big rushes. Um, and had one pass that I know he wants back. Uh, it would have been a tough catch, but he's made plenty of tough catches in his career. He didn't come up with this one. But Dom Allen did uh, did find uh, Josh LeBlanc for a key touchdown. So let's pass. talk about the QB situation. How did that play out? Dom played the entire game except for maybe one or two snaps after his long run. They put in Jordan Black to give Dom a blow <laughs> after that. But uh, Dom played fine, especially getting the ball to the slot backs and uh, carrying the ball himself. 
the touchdown pass was funny because um, on the on the second down play from about the 25, they left Raleigh Webb completely uncovered uh, up the right side, and Dom didn't see him oh. and threw an incomplete pass. I think it was to Cam Jackson. And then they came back on the next play and ran the same thing to the other side uh, to Josh LeBlanc. Josh was covered, but Dom threw a great pass over the DB's head, settled right into Josh's arms for a 25-yard touchdown. So I told Dom he was going to kick himself when he saw that play on tape. He knew right. he knew that he had missed a wide-open Raleigh Webb. Uh, it was like a Kentucky-Florida situation. They just didn't cover him right. at all. And I, I guarantee you that's going to be something that they're going to touch on Sunday. They're going to talk about Friday before the next game and be like, look, guys, like these are what we set up ourselves for. We can't miss these. we got to make sure we're looking in the right spot. we got to do you know, all these things. And um, Let's talk about turnovers. Mm-hmm. How did that play out in this game? Played out great. Uh, no fumbles at all. No interceptions. You know, They had had seven fumbles in the previous two games. I think I don't know how many of the lost, three or four. Uh, but when you even when you put the ball on the ground, even if you get it back, that's it's a negative still, play. Right, right. You're probably going to lose yards unless you fumble at the end of a long gain. Uh, so no fumbles. They handled the ball great. Um, Raleigh Webb got 43 yards on a reverse. So it's great to see him Fast guy right getting there. in there. Oh, what, what an athlete he is. So they did a good job of uh, spreading the ball around and getting it to the slot backs more. It's hard for a slot back to get more than nine or ten carries. That's just the right. nature of the triple option. Yep. But, you know, Grant Drakeford averaged more than ten yards a carry. Cam had a good average. So those guys can, uh, when they get the ball, they can be dangerous. Right. Uh, the problem all year has been with the B-back game, and uh, that is what it is for now. We'll see if Brandon Berry can make a difference uh, against VMI. Yeah, I mean, that would be something, again, we talked about last week, is getting momentum for next season and worst case scenario, work ne- you know, get the momentum for next season. Mm-hmm. And a guy like that, getting a guy like that involved, you know, getting him confident so that when he goes into the off season, he's confident and uh, can really make some adjust. You, you know, know, that would be big, huge. Brandon Barry, uh, you know, this is projecting out a long way, but if he plays well against VMI, he could make a big difference down the stretch against right. the Western Carolina firm. If they can get that B back going at game going at all. It can really help everything else. You know, my my experience from playing Western Carolina is if I'm going to circle one of those top teams that, hey, we can run the be back against, I'm going to say Western. I, I just, from my experience with their D-line and, you know, how they tend to play us, I would say um, I would I would be confident against Western Carolina. I just don't think they play the, the run very, very tough um, in my experience. So I think that would be a good game to get that going. And I, I know, like the fact that they play Western Carolina at home first before they have to go to Furman so right. they can play VMI kind of if they can beat VMI kind of build on that yep. play Western Carolina at home and if they win that game whew, that game at Furman will be huge for both teams yes that will be so we're going to take a quick break we're going to get right back and we're going to talk about homecoming week for the dog we're going to talk about the VMI matchup what that means for both teams and the Silver Seiko and uh, what that means for both programs so we'll be right back and uh, thank you for joining us Welcome back to the Citadel Gray Line. My name is Kyle Weaver. I'm an ex Citadel offensive lineman. Uh, played in uh, the homecoming series for the last five years, was part of that, and uh, luckily never lost to VMI. So uh, I'm here with Jeff Hartzell, um, the writer from the Post and Courier who follows Citadel football, and we're excited to talk Citadel football after a win. And, you know, be positive. And then going into homecoming week, which is a, a big week for every Citadel fan, um, but it's also a big week for Citadel football as it's for the Covenant Silver Shaco. So uh, we're excited to uh, have that rivalry back. Um, so we've had the Shaco since, I believe, 2003. 2003. The, it's a 10-game win streak. There was a 
some gap in the rivalry there for a couple of years. So it's been to, since 2003 that the Citadel has owned the Silver Shaco, which goes to the winner of the Military Classic of the South. And uh, as you might have read this week, Brent Thompson likes to play yeah. some games with the Silver Shaco. He said he hid it from you guys last right. year. Maybe took a couple of days for anybody to notice. Uh, he wanted uh, you guys to see what it might be like if the Silver Shaco wasn't sitting in the office yeah. uh, on the trophy table. And uh, this week, he says he's bringing it with him to all the team meetings, putting it right next to him. And he wants the guys to see it and to understand uh, there's a trophy at stake. And anytime there's a trophy at stake, you know, that's a big game. That is. You know, um, you know that, that's like Walford. You know, it's mm -hmm. extra motivation for that trophy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's something that if you don't have it, you know, uh, if, if like so if these guys since we've had it since 2003 mm -hmm. you feel bad losing it since mm -hmm. you know they haven't we've had it for so long so um it's one of those things where it's just extra motivation the military i remember when i came on my recruiting visit cool little story it's coming on my recruiting visit i was sitting in the home side and the vmi cadets came down a few of them and they were sitting in the um and we actually had the cadets sitting on the other side of the field at that time so our cadets uh, went over and stole one of the VMI players' helmets mm -hmm. and was just tossing it around up in the stands. And I was like, "Man, this is crazy!" You know, this is like, you know. So I loved it as a rec uh, as a recruit, and uh, you know that was cool. And then like one of the VMI moms came over and ran over and stole the helmet back, and yeah. it, it was funny. But um, of course, you know, the that's... great the great story is uh, I think it was about 2006 or so. Uh, some of the Citadel cadets tried to mess with a, a little dog that the VMI cheerleaders have, kind okay. of a mascot. Yeah. And the VMI cheerleader got a knob, a female cheerleader. Oh, and the headlock. Remember that? Yeah, the headlock. Oh, I've seen it. It just went to town. You can find it on YouTube. Oh. Uh, but uh, that was a great moment in Citadel VMI history. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's great. You know, you have two two sides to understand the cadet lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that, that fun and that, you know, just messing with people comes out in a game like this. And well, it's, it brings an interesting point. You know, you look at Clemson, Carolina, there's no doubt who Clemson's rival is, right. who Carolina's rival is. It's, Citadel seems to be a little different. You've got They're Furman. Confused. you got, uh, I don't know if it's confused, but you just have a series of rivals, which I think is cool. you got Furman, kind of your big in-state rival that the alums want to beat. Right. you got Wofford, which uh, the current and recent players, right. that's a big game for them just because the, the two have been so competitive and competing for league titles. You've got the VMI, which is the military classic of the South, two, two military schools, the only two schools like that right. in Division One football. And then, uh, of course, you have Charleston Southern, which kind of is your local rival when you, when you play them. So it's kind of interesting uh, to get different people's views of who is the Citadel's rival. It is. And I know you said Wofford was big for you guys. Definitely. Where did VMI kind of rank? Uh, you know, like if I had to circle a game, I would not circle VMI just because they're a team that's 0-8 mm -hmm. uh, or just hasn't been competitive. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you don't want to lose to them. You always want to have those bragging rights over it. You know, the, the military aspect brings in a little, little rivalry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I'm going to say, like, there was never, you know, when you when it's Walford week or when it's uh, Furman week or any of those weeks, like, there's an extra extra focus. There's mm -hmm. an extra, like, hey, if we don't come to play, these guys will destroy. You know, like, they will, like, mm -hmm. have no problem, you know, beating us. Mm -hmm. And vmi it's you know hey there's no they don't have a problem beating us mm -hmm. and they don't have a problem pulling out all these trick plays and we do have to play well and expect mm -hmm. everything however you know it wasn't for a socon championship or this or that like we've seen with walford right. you know going and losing the way we lost to walford you know i also think has a huge effect on why i view them as a rival mm -hmm. you know we lost to them on a, on a six yard line mm -hmm. somebody called a touchdown somebody didn't you know vmi haven't had that experience you know we've, mm -hmm. we've gone up and Played some tough games, yes, but uh, overall have had some success. Now, going into this game, how how do the teams match up? How does our offense match up against their defense, rushing-wise, as well as how does our defense match up as their offense? Well, VMI has really struggled in all phases of the game. They, <clears throat> they rank last in the league in most major categories, scoring offense, uh, total offense, scoring defense, uh, total defense. They've really had a... A tough year. Uh, their quarterback now is a young man named Duncan Hodges. He's a redshirt freshman, and he's the brother of Sanford's quarterback, Devlin Hodges. Oh, wow. 
and Devlin Hodges is obviously uh, the preseason SOCOM player of the year, having a great year. Duncan Hodges is about 6'3", 220, uh, redshirt freshman. He is not at his brother's level as of yet. Uh, he, he just started the last couple of games. I'm not sure if their first quarterback got hurt or just benched or, right. or what happened there. But Duncan Hodges is the man now. And uh, he threw, I think, three or four interceptions in his first game and, and is averaging – about 80 passing yards a game. So they, they've struggled a little bit uh, moving the ball. Uh, I think they're running the ball a little bit more this year than in past years. They have a good running back named Daz Palmer, who uh, obviously he he might have some problems with the offensive line or something, but he's a good player. Right. So they do have some good players. Uh, Scott Walkenheim is the coach. He's in a, his third year. He was an, an assistant at Air Force. Okay. So uh, – Knows the triple pretty well. He's facing the uh, the usual problem of trying to rebuild VMI football that all the coaches seem to have. Uh, yeah, Sparky. He replaced Sparky Woods, who people down here will remember for his time at USC as the head coach. Yeah, I mean so. they're they're a team just like the Citadel. They're, they, you know they've had some tough times, and um, it's tough to to recruit to that. Well, the, VMI and the Citadel are very similar schools, but there's some crucial differences, especially in how football is run and athletics in general. You know, the Citadel has a graduate school right. that makes it so easy for guys to redshirt, uh, take you know, take an extra year, go get their MBA, live off campus, yeah. and play and play football. VMI does not have a grad school, so for their kids to redshirt, they have to take a ninth semester. Mm-hmm which means put off graduating, don't graduate with your classmates. Extra semester as a cadet. In living the in the barracks. You know, they're not living off campus at all, still in the barracks. So, uh, and there's other issues like that. Uh, some, I don't know if you call them concessions, but some things the Citadel administration does that VMI does not do right. to help football and other sports. So it's, it's a tougher atmosphere up there, no question about it. And then you look at like players like Mario Cooper, um, and I can't mention his name, I can't, remember his name, but the guy who transferred in this year, the linebacker, mm-hmm. um, you know, Stevens, you know, these uh, guys, Cody Clark, your kicker, yeah, last Cody year. Clark. I mean, it's like, you know, you take those guys away, you know, they might not have been our superstar. Some of them were, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like they just bring that little tiny edge that we might've needed. Like Mario Cooper, bringing that experience. Who knows into, how last year goes without Cody Clark. Right. As your kicker, the kicking situation might've been pretty dire yep. without Cody Clark. And he made some awful big kicks. He struggled in that final game against Wofford, but he made some big kicks throughout the season. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, again, we talked about uh, the little things that add up, you know, mm-hmm. Army contracts. Now now you have something like this. I mean, it, it's tough, and, uh, you know, also they're not in the number one city in the world, Charleston, so I know <laughs> that makes it a little easy to No recruit. beach in Lexington, Virginia. Yeah, and uh, but, you know, what a cool spot. I love the mountains. I always love making trips like that in Western Carolina. Mm-hmm. You know, um, especially West. I mean, you just you're in that, especially this time of year when it's getting cold. Like if, if you ever go up there, which we're not, but you know, it's cold. It's it's a it's a great trip. So, um, you know, th- this year's kind of road schedule is kind of tougher. You got a lot of long trips, a lot of three day weekends and all yeah. that. So these guys yeah. are kind of like Looking forget the forward. Uh, they went to ETSU, Sanford, and Chattanooga this year. <laughs> There's got to be a way. <laughs> Not to, not to have to do all three in yeah. the same season. You know what I mean? Those right. are three three long trips. You know, it's tough, and, you know, you would think that would be, you know, the SOCOM would think about that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, hey, it's it's just how it is. And but at least they're not having to go to VMI right. in the same year as those right. other trips. Yeah, that's that's a good one. And then, like, you know, you have, like, the Walford game. Like, the, uh, you have Furman at re- really close to home. I mean, we're lucky that we're, we kind of have a lot of, like, Mercer. You think about their away trips. Every trip is a good trip for them, mm-hmm. is, a, is a longer trip for them. So And Samford. You know, you know VMI, there. that's a long – like, you know, so I, mean, I guess everybody travels a good bit. But yeah. I feel like we're in a good spot to get to Furman, to get to Walford. I feel like Furman and Walford really have the ideal location for yep. the SOCOM. But um, – you know, overall, this is going to be a great week. I know a lot of my buddies, my classmates, my teammates are coming back in town, so we're excited about that. As I know, is hopefully we'll have a big crowd, bigger than normal. And, uh, you know, I know that was something that the coaches would preach to us during the week as well. It's like, hey, you're going to be playing in front of a lot, large crowd. This is, you know, a good time to, to get those guys to support you. So it would be um, great if they could break into, du- uh, I say double figures, four figures. Five figures right. this week, uh, which, which is to say 10,000 people. Right. With the uh, only only 1,000 
seats available now on the visitor side for the time being or the east side. Right. If you could pack the home side, that's about 10 and uh, pack the visitor side, that's 11. Definitely. So uh, a crowd of 11,000 is doable. Uh, right. This weekend. All right. Sounds good. Uh, we'll be right back. We're going to talk some more. So football, we're going to talk about how the SOCON is playing out and uh, how the other teams are looking as well as what uh, we can look forward moving forward and maybe some concerns. And then we're going to talk to our special guest, Joe Crochet, um, who was an All-American academic as well as a first team all-conference player. So we're looking forward to that. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Citadel Gray Line. I'm here. My name is Kyle Weaver. I'm here with Jeff Hartzell from the Post and Courier. Uh, we're excited tonight. Uh, excited to announce that this is our 249th show. So next week will be our 250th show, which, Jeff, you've been a part of all of those. And uh, we're going to have the original host, John Raw, and then we're going to have Jim Waddell to Waddell. Waddell to appear on next week's show. And uh, from what John tells me, it's going to be a, a big blowout. He's going to try Jim, to have – Jim was co-host for a, a lot of those shows yep. yeah, as so, well. Those guys are going to come back. They're going to make an appearance. They're going to be down in Charleston or on the phone, and we're excited to have those guys back as well as just celebrate uh, you guys supporting us for 250 shows. And also, we have a new sponsor, um, the Hampton Inn & Suites by the Charleston Airport. It opened in 2017, and it's on Montague Avenue. And uh, if you would like to make reservations for this week, uh, their phone number is 843 843-990. 5100 and just let them know that you guys heard it from us. They're minutes away from uh, the, the Citadel and it's a great location to be out there with tons of restaurants So, and it's a brand new very nice facility so we appreciate their support and uh, you know, we're glad to have you guys on board. So before we talk to our special guest Joe Crochet, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, con the SOCON and how it's playing out. Um, you know, we're kind of seeing, we can kind of see the past now. We can see that, you know, Wofford looks strong. They, they haven't well, they, really. Well, they finally lost a game last week. They lost to Sanford. Uh-oh. 24-21 uh, by three points. So they've played <laughs> close games. This is amazing. Uh, in SoCon games, they've scored 128 points and given it 118. That's 10-point difference Man. in five games. So that's two points a game right. in league play. That's amazing. But they finally lost uh, to Sanford 24-21 to last week. And so that really puts uh, three-way tie. Three-way tie at the top, and then Sanford Maybe is three and four. one. So um, I think you have four teams, right, competing uh, for the league championship wow. as of now. Wofford, Western, and Furman are all four and one. Sanford is three and one. So those four teams, you know, really have a shot at sharing or winning the conference title. And uh, – and making the playoffs. So the Citadel is going to have to knock off Western and Furman if they want to have any shot at the playoffs. So the big game this week is Furman at Western Carolina, two teams that are tied for first place. Obviously, one of them will no longer be tied for first after this weekend, right. at least for the time being. So that's a huge game. It's at Western Carolina. Furman is the hottest team in the league. They've won five games in a row after an 0-3 start. So Clay Hendricks and his new coaching staff have really uh, turned things around at Furman. Wofford has already beaten Western and Furman and lost to Sanford, so they've already played uh, the next three teams uh, with them in the in the standings. So Wofford's schedule will ease up a little bit right from here on out. Well, you know that's uh, you know it's that's I didn't know so Wofford lost to Sanford. So you, uh, you you have to figure Wofford, they play ETSU, Chattanooga, and v VMI. You have to figure they're going to finish 7-1 and one right. in the uh, in the SOCON. So, so Western, Wofford's looking good. Western, Furman, this is a, basically an elimination game, you okay. have to say, this right. weekend between Western and Furman. And then Sanford is going to have to finish out uh, without a loss as well. They play Chattanooga, Mercer, ETSU, and Furman. So could, Sanford, could Sanford could win out. 
Yeah, but as you well. Know, they, have, they have to play Furman. Furman has to play them. Right. Furman has to play Western Carolina. So, mm-hmm. you know, definitely Walford looking like uh, the So, it, it's beat, a great so. race down the stretch. You couldn't ask for a better race, except maybe if the Citadel was in it. It might be more exciting uh, yeah, for yeah. us. More exciting But the for Citadel us. has their own goals, you know, a winning season and a and possibly a shot at 7-4 and four at the playoffs. Yeah, let's talk about the Citadel. So, you know, some concerns moving forward. Kylie Williams, let's uh, update us on that situation. Looked like he got a little hurt in uh, the game, and tell us a little bit about that. He went to break up a pass, I think it was early in the second half, and did not get up right away, and it looks like it's a hamstring. Okay, and, uh, day-to-day. Day-to-day. He did not come back in the game. Kafari Buffalo came in and did a good job in his place. He's day-to-day. Wouldn't shock me if they try to beat VMI without him right. and let him rest up and get ready for these crucial games against Western and Furman. Yeah, you know, that's that's a, that's a good thing about having a game like this is, mm-hmm. you know, guys like him uh, and VMI is not a – doesn't seem to be a pass-happy offense and hasn't been in the past. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, hopefully a guy like that can take a break and recover a little bit mm-hmm. and maybe we can you know get our starters out of the game hopefully and uh get them a little bit of rest as well uh, we already talked about our rushing defense you know they, they played iffy in the first but came back in the second half um you know i think this will be a good game to be able to experiment with that you know, miles pierce had another great game he is really playing fantastic this year he had eight tackles and uh the kid that caught my eye i heard his name a lot was noah dawkins uh the junior linebacker you know what athlete he is. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah, one of those guys that uh, just NFL-type numbers. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh, crazy. And um, uh, he, he really got into the pass rush, got after the quarterback. Only one sack but three pressures, and one of those was on Chattanooga. Had four shots from the 11-yard line at the end of the game, and on one of those plays uh, – Noah Dawkins had a pressure that forced an incompletion. So he's really getting after the quarterback. Uh, Coach Thompson says he just needs to uh, shore up his technique a little bit, get a little bit better, get guys on the ground. But the athletic ability and the ability to rush the quarterback is right. pretty evident for Noah Dawkins. Yeah. And the last thing we want to talk about is the, the turnovers. You know, in a game like we're playing VMI where, you know, we think we're the better team going in, you know, turnovers is, is the one way that anybody can beat any, anybody. So, exactly. Uh, you know, that's something that we got to really focus on this week. We can't give them opportunities to stay in the game and opportunities to, uh, you know, play with us. So, um, we're very excited. I'll be at the game. I'm excited about it. I got a bunch of buddies coming in town, um, and I know you know that's how Citadel is. So a lot of people will be back in town. So we're excited about that. We're gonna uh, take a quick break. We're gonna hook up with uh, Joe Crochet here on the phone. We we'll talk a little bit about him. He's got some great stuff going on, and uh, we're gonna you know just pick his brain about some Citadel football. So we'll be right back. And uh, thank you for joining us. Joe, what's up, man? Can you hear us? I can. How you doing? Doing well, man. Well, hey, I'm going to take a little quick break. We're going to intro into the segment, man, and we'll, uh, I'll ask you some questions about what, uh, 
what we talked about last night. Okay, man? Perfect. All right, bro. Welcome back to the Citadel Gray Line. My name is Kyle Weaver. I'm an ex Citadel football player. Um, I'm here with Jeff Hartzell from the Post and Courier, and we have our special guest on the phone right now, uh, Joe Crochet. Joe, thank you for joining us. I know you have a vi very busy schedule. Uh, we appreciate you finding time to uh, join our show today. Thank you for reaching out to me. I mean, uh, you know, it's definitely a blessing anytime I can talk on the phone with Kyle Weaver and then Jeff Hartzell <laughs> alone in the hub with the Citadel family. There you go, man. Well, hey, uh, you know, first thing I want to ask you, man, is um, – you know, I tried my hardest, just didn't happen. But, you know, you were one of those guys at the Citadel who had success on and off the field. You were a All-American, two-time academic All-American, as well as your senior year, you were All-Conference as a defensive linebacker or D-end. I forget what they classify you as. I know you were a hybrid player, but I know you were first-team All-Conference. But more of the story is what what does it take to be a guy who succeeds both uh, in the classroom and on the field at a place like the Citadel? I mean, it, it, it takes a lot. Uh, and just to say, I mean, Kyle, the only, the only thing I, I did besides, you know, what you did is I just graduated a semester early. I mean, you know, Slodge and I mean, we're both in great situations where we both have our MBA, both graduate Citadel early. Um, so, I mean, you can attest to some of the things that, that kind of were able to, to get me through the, the Citadel. But, I mean, first and foremost, uh, you know, give God all the credit. Uh, without him, uh, none of this would be possible. So definitely awesome. having a spiritual life and a spiritual presence is uh, a huge thing for a foundation and just to build on. Uh, secondly, you know, support from all our teammates, family, friends. Uh, I mean, you know, our crew that we had, and we were roommates, uh, throughout our time at the Citadel and just being around people that, that were supportive and driving you to, to be the best version of yourself you could be actually, athletically helped out a lot as well. And then, uh, lastly, there's no way um, you can attest to that we would be able to graduate early for that sports center. Right. Um, yeah. Which, yeah. Which Kate, Kate, Kate does a great job over help. there. I mean, they, they did a great job setting up our schedule and, uh, <clears throat> I mean, they, they help out a lot of people. It's open to cadets and, uh, you know, core squad athletes as well. But uh, they did a great job setting us up and kind of giving us a guideline to, to Mandatory follow. study halls and all those things and just staying on you and keeping you accountable for for stuff. And I, I attribute a lot of my success as well academically to that as well. Um, Jeff, do you have any questions for Joe? Joe, uh, what point in your academic career did you decide you wanted to try to graduate in three years? So, uh, you know, actually, initially, uh, my freshman year, when, when they told me I was redshirted, I wanted to do it in three and a half because uh, I knew I would have five years to play four. And uh, my goal was to get into grad school and have them pay for a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after about two years, I, I realized it was possible to, to kind of push that deadline even closer and do it in three. And... Uh, so about two years into the Citadel, I moved the deadline from three and a half to three. Uh, they were able to pay for, for everything. Kyle, Kyle can attest to it, too. We, we both got a really, really good situation out of it, and uh, it was a really special time as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, from, from talking to Joe and being around Joe a lot, you know, one of the things Joe, you know, kind of did was we were, we were all around for summer classes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, say freshman year, before your freshman year, you take two classes at six hours. You know, after your freshman year, another six. After your sophomore year, another six. So graduating in three and a half is, is tough. But a guy like Joe is uh, able to carry a load of 21 hours in season, mm. um, which a typical load at a regular school would be about 15. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you add our military classes on, which people won't really consider real classes. But honestly, they, they do take up some time after, you know, going junior, senior year. They ruined my 4-0 a few times. <laughs> um, and Joe was, was – that's 18. Then you take an extra class on that. So, you know, Joe and, and myself were able to take 21 hours and a semester as well as your summer classes, and that really boosts you up. So yeah. – um, and, I mean, off-campus life is, uh, you know, definitely a motivation itself right there. Yeah. Um, Joe, so – 
what are you up to these days? What, uh, what can we learn about you? What has uh, Citadel football taught you now that you're in the, the corporate world? Uh, it's, I mean, it's taught me a lot. Um, right now I'm uh, marketing and, and sales for uh, Stanley Black & Decker. Um, they're a power tool company. They own DeWalt, Porter Cable, Boss Ditch. Um, and, and right now, I mean, kind of the, the things that I've learned through the Citadel and especially the football team is, is you know, how to thrive in a team atmosphere. And, and uh, you know, in sales, it's very competitive. So using, using that competitive edge that, that we develop as athletes uh, – toward, you know, meeting goals and, and surpassing, you know, expectations that um, that have been set. So a lot of it's just, you know, the, the fundamentals that you learn just playing, playing the game of football that you learn at a young age, but at the same time you can sharpen your skills and tone them in college, and, and I'm able to use, use everything that I've learned and apply it to the real world. So, it's, so let's, let's get into helpful. this. So uh, both me and you had three coaches in five years. You even had more position coaches. Um, tell us from a guy who's been on winning, winning seasons, losing seasons, back to winning seasons, you know, in a year like this year, what, uh, you know, what does it take to be a leader on a team like this as well as what, what does it take to change a team's culture? Yeah. So, uh, so fortunately enough, you know, our, our, our last season there last year, 2016, you and I were both captains and, uh, you know, our class kind of, kind of brought this wave as far as the, the new transformation of what Citadel football is. And, and really the biggest changes that we made were, uh, you know, the culture of the team. So you got to have a great team culture. Like you have to be able to bond with each other inside and outside of the locker room and, and kind of develop a family family atmosphere and, and a brotherhood. Um, so you're playing for more than yourself on the field, and, and it's bigger than just, you know, yourself when you're making those plays or, uh, you feel like quitting. You're, you you got to do it for the other person. So the culture change, and then also uh, leadership. I mean, I think we had great leadership throughout our class. I mean, James Riley, M. Fry, uh, yourself, myself. I mean, Eric Jones, and this goes on and on. But uh, I mean, having a, a, a leadership to keep everybody as well to to make sure that we're doing and meeting the expectations that's been set. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, just to remind everybody, we're on the phone with Joe Crochet, all-conference defensive player and uh, stand-up guy. Um, you know, last question I want to talk to you. Uh, I, you, you mentioned a, uh, that you put together some, you know, stories and events from your time at the Citadel, both as a cadet, uh, your personal life, and on the football field. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, what you're kind of doing with that, and... Uh, you know, what we can be as viewers and supporters of you. Yeah, so, uh, so it's kind of funny, you know, we, you, finish, you finish football in, in, in school and your, your 60, 70-hour weeks turn into just a 9 to 5 and you have a lot <laughs> more time. Um, so there was a void I needed to fill. And, and you know, you and I both being on, on teams that have won two conference championships, I mean, there's only been four in the whole history of the school. I mean, the school's been around since 1842. Football at the Citadel started in the early 1900s. Uh, I mean, so the fact that we both share, you know, two out of the four, 50% of the four conference championships that ever been or happened at the Citadel is just something special in itself. And uh, let alone that our leadership qualities and just being being part of, you know, the, the culture change and, and going from, you know, teams that were mediocre to, to – a conference championship program um, basically is a story in itself. So, uh, so yeah, I had a lot, a lot of free time, and I was like, well, you know, my story, because what are they going to remember from the 2015-2016 season? Because there's such uh, I wrote, I decided to start writing a book and uh, developed a 30-page book for my first book. It's a two-book series uh, <laughs> called My Winning Um you know, kind of taken from Pat Conroy's my losing season. It puts a spin, a positive spin on, on the Citadel and our experience. And, uh, really talks about the first book talks about kind of knob year matriculation day, uh, you know, all the ins and outs as far as going through the, the culture change and being on the first conference championship team. And, you know, talks about our crew that we had, our roommates and, and kind of, you know, the events that happened on and off campus and, and then the second book's going to specifically just talk about the 2016 
season itself being the best season in the school history. Right. So, so, so right but, now, when we talked, your book is in the editing stages. Is that correct? Right. So uh, I'm editing it right now and uh, talking with uh, two publishing companies. And uh, the plan is once once I get approval from the school and approval from everyone that's mentioned in the book as far as a liability standpoint and uh, and get this process in for with the best way to market it um, and promote it and publish it, uh, hopefully have it where people can purchase it in stores by, uh, by January or February of next year. Awesome. That's awesome, Joe. And if you'd like me to read it for you, I'd be glad to. Uh, yeah. And uh, guy with some industry yeah. experience right there. Yeah, and so. the, our newspaper has a book publishing division, uh, so uh, maybe you can get in touch with them as well. Because I'm sure a lot of people in the Charleston area would be interested. No, that would be a great in, uh, great partnership right there. Mm-hmm. So, Jeff, you have anything else for uh, Joe before we let him go? And No, I'm glad to hear he's, he's writing a book and putting down his memories yeah. of uh, two special seasons at the Citadel. So I look forward to reading that. Well, Joe, uh, thank you for joining us on the show today. Um, I just want to remind you guys that next week will be our 250th episode, and we're going to have uh, you know we're going to have some cake here. We're going to have some you know we're going to have a little party. So please come join us. Um, invite all your friends. We're going to love to have again. We're at the Charleston Sports Pub in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, right off 17. Great food. I, I can smell our food ready, Jeff, and, <laughs> and it's going to taste great. So I'm excited about that. Um, I'm also excited to have people like Joe back in town this uh, weekend for the game, and uh, so you know. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you next week for some more Citadel football. Thanks for joining us, guys, and thanks, Joe Crow, for joining us. See you guys. Thank you all so much. Go dogs. Go dogs, baby.